Good morning, everybody. How you doing? Good. I'm Aaron, and today I'll be talking to you about a couple different pests in the garden. Uh, and to kind of outline my presentation first, I'm going to talk about cockroach biodiversity in general, and then I'm going to specifically talk about cockroaches that are present in the garden. I'm going to talk about fire ants and their control. A new ant, pest ant in uh, Louisiana and the southern United States, the tiny crazy ant. Then I'm going to talk about ground nesting yellow jackets and then the giant cicada killer. So believe it or not, most cockroaches are not considered pest insects in the traditional sense. There is about 4,500 known species of cockroaches and there's potentially up to 9,000 that are unidentified at this time. They are one of the oldest insect body forms and they've actually remained unchanged for about 150 million years. So they've kind of reached their perfection in some ways, if you will. And overall, there are about 1% of cockroach species are considered pest insects. And most of them are considered beneficial because they consume decaying material out of the environment. But also that is a problem for us when they are pest cockroaches. And I'll talk about that more in a little bit. And believe it or not, a lot of cockroaches are colorful insects. If you can't have a favorite cockroach, this could be it. This is the Mardi Gras cockroach. This is from Australia and New Zealand. It has these nice metallic green colors, a uh, nice little gray and yellow on it. And it kind of looks like a trilobite, which is a prehistoric uh, organism. We also have this bush cockroach here. This is another cockroach from Australia and New Zealand. It has nice uh, yet white and orange colors on it. It has a nice patterning on its wings or wing covers. This is a ladybug mimic cockroach, so it mimics a ladybug in order to defend itself and seem like a uh, not a good food source. This is from the Philippines. And then there's also this very cool lightning cockroach. This is from South America. And if you put it underneath a black light, it glows like this. And people like it as well because it looks like a Jawa from Star Wars. So just to give you an idea, there is kind of a lot of diversity within cockroaches and they can look nice as well. And even in Louisiana, we have some cockroaches that are attractive in coloration. So this first one I want to talk about is the pale bordered field cockroach. This is a native cockroach to the southern United States. It has black on its wing covers and it has white borders and then red on its pronotum, which is the area behind its head. And a little bit of history for you, this cockroach was actually first identified in Louisiana in a men's clothing store on a tuxedo in 1967, so it does no good dress when it sees it. It primarily lives outdoors, uh, and again, this is native to the southeastern United States. It's not considered a pest cockroach, and it's a small insect, it's about half an inch to five eighths of an inch in size. And where you probably see it is out in the garden. They'll be in the herbaceous plants and the leaf litter, and they'll fly around from plant to plant, kind of looking like a beetle in some ways. Again, they're, they're a strong flyer, so this is a cockroach that is capable of flight, and they're only active for a few months during the summertime, and they're probably not even around anymore. Now we talk about another cockroach that has an attractive coloration, that has some nice green and yellow on it, and this is the Cuban cockroach. It's a non-native cockroach to the United States, but it is spread well throughout the southern United States, and it was brought into the United States in banana shipments. So what do you think its other name is? Banana. Yeah, it's a banana cockroach. So, uh, and uh, something that is neat about it is actually the males are smaller than the females. So this is the male right here, and then the adult, and this is the female here, it's like bigger in size, and then these are the nymphs, so they're not as attractive as nymphs, uh, unfortunately. But you'll find them out in your lawn, soil, the moist leaf litter in the garden, uh, and wooded areas. And when you do find them, you're not going to see them for very long because they're very fast and they are a strong flyer, so they'll probably be gone pretty quickly. They're not considered a traditional pest cockroach, but they will enter the house if they give them an opportunity. Uh, and that is because they're attracted to the lights around the house. And so some things that we can do for that is instead of using white lights, we want to use yellow lights. And you don't want to have those lights right up against the house if possible. You have them moved away from the house and then direct them towards the entryways that you want the light to be shining on. And we can use some insecticide to control them, but it's not necessarily the best strategy because they're kind of dispersed throughout the environment. And so uh, excluding them from the house is in fact the best way to control them. So sealing up gaps 
and shaping our land scenarios if possible. But unfortunately, Louisiana also has a lot of pest cockroaches, and so the majority of the ones that I will uh, that are actually in the state are considered pests, despite many of them not being pest insects globally. So cockroaches have different environmental preferences. Some of them reside in the garden, as opposed to some of the other traditional pests that we're familiar with, like the American cockroach, which lives in sewers and drains, and the German cockroach, which particularly lives indoors. And so what is problematic about cockroaches is, again, they feed on this decaying organic material, and if they're in a sewer, for example, and they come into our homes, they can transfer that, uh, back, those bacteria uh, from the environment, they could be potentially pathogenic, and so that's why we want to control them when given an opportunity to. And also, cockroaches can spread allergenic proteins, and that can cause asthma development if you inhale it. And so I'm going to talk about some cockroaches that are particularly pests to the garden now. And I'm going to ask, what do you think this cockroach is? Now, this is, it looks like another pest cockroach, but this leaf might give you a hint that it is outdoors as opposed to being indoors. Does anyone any have a guess what it might be? Leaf minor cockroach. No? Well, that's okay. So this is actually the Asian cockroach, but it closely resembles the German cockroach, which is one of the biggest pest insects of a cockroach. And the German cockroach only lives indoors, but the Asian cockroach prefers to be in the outdoor environment. It was introduced to Florida in the 1980s, and actually it wasn't a known species at the time. There was a publication that had came out right around that night, in the early 1980s when this insect was later discovered, and that, that book actually had to be updated because this insect was not in it. And since its introduction, it's been well established throughout the southeastern United States. And one easy way to tell it apart from the German cockroach is that this cockroach is capable of flight. The German cockroach cannot fly. And this is another small insect. They're about 5 eighths of an inch in size. And this is what the nymphs look like. So they, again, they look like a German cockroach nymph, but they're a little bit more white in color. So it's very hard to tell them apart besides them being outside as opposed to inside. They'll reside out in the reef litter in the garden. So they can build up with a very large numbers in, in these different environments, primarily leaf litter and mulches. And these are pest insects. They will enter your home similarly to the human cockroach because they're attracted to those lights and they'll come inside if given an opportunity to. They also enter into gardens and agri agricultural production areas and they'll feed upon small seedlings. So that's also why they're considered a garden pest is because when there's plants out there that are vulnerable to feeding those soft seedlings with those nice tissue, they'll come and feed upon it. And they also might eat pests eggs for other insects, and so there could be some benefits to this cockroach, but in reality it's probably more of a pest. And now I'm going to talk about the Suriname cockroach, another cockroach that primarily lives in the garden and in potted soils. So it's originally from the Pacific Island region, and where it likes to reside in is loose soils and in potted plants, and because of that it's been shipped all over the world and is now considered a global pest because it's desire to be in potted plants and soil. And so when we buy soil from different countries or potted plants, they get sent, and this cockroach inadvertently gets sent along with it. So in its native range, it has both males and females, but outside of it, they're all females, and every cockroach is a clone of the original female. So because of that, there's some potential size differences and coloration differences in the Suriname cockroach, but they primarily have this olive-colored uh, wing covers, they have this black pronotum, the area behind its head, and they have some yellow patterning on the edges of their abdomen. And they're about three-fourths inches to one inch in size, and that size can vary based on uh, the original parent. Yes? I don't understand what, what do you mean by clone? So female or cockroaches, uh, females are parthenogenic, which means that they can lay eggs without mating. So they're already um, able to reproduce without a male. But the thing is that some cockroaches, when there isn't a male pres present, essentially those uh, females, that population goes down over time. Like they have smaller size and they're le less fit. But the Suriname cockroach doesn't have those problems. The females are just able to reproduce without any uh, negative consequences. Yes. And, and 
then it's part of, partly that reason is why it has become such a good pest insect, mm -hmm. because they can just reproduce by themselves. So they're typically outdoors, but they will come into the indoor environment and reside in potted plants. They'll also go into terrariums. And they are considered a pest cockroach. They primarily feed upon plants. They will consume small seedlings, just like the uh, Asian cockroach. And they can also destroy house plants and potted plants by feeding upon the roots. <laughs> also, they have the potential to vector roundworms to poultry. They act as an intermediate of a, of a nematode. And so when the poultry is consumed, the cockroach, they become infected with roundworms in that case. So another reason why we want to control these cockroaches. I have a question. Yes. Does diatomaceous earth effectively heal them? Yes, the diatomaceous earth is one of the products that you can, one of the dust products you can use for cockroach control. And then, uh, so these are some, I'll also talk about a couple other things that we can do for cockroach control. Uh, and these are general uh, strategies. This will also work for other cockroaches around the home. And it's first, we want to reduce that preferred habitat, like the wood piles, the mulch, when possible, the leaf litter that we have around the home. If possible, trim plants so they're not directly contacting your house. We also want to thin the layer of mulch that we have. That gets thinner in depth, it's less likely for a cockroach to reside in it. So if we could have mulch to be about two, two to three inches thick, will have less environments for those cockroaches to hang out in. Now, the preferred method is similar to ants, is we actually want to use these broad class flake or granular bait insecticides. These are very palatable for the cockroaches and they'll seek them out in the environment, feed upon them, and control them that way. But we can also use spray insecticides or dusts to control them. Now, when you do a spray insecticide, you can do a perimeter treatment around your house the first few feet up, like three or four feet up from the, uh, the ground, and then also maybe 10 to 15 feet out from your house if you want to spray an insecticide. But also you can spray directly to areas that you know cockroaches are residing in, and it's the same thing for the dust insecticides. As a general rule, we don't want to put insecticides out when it's raining because it will just run off and won't be an effective treatment. Yeah. <laughs> And also, we, we don't want to be applying when uh, the soil is wet because uh, the soil will be saturated and uh, essentially we'll have an ineffective treatment because of that as well. And again, we want to make sure that we're using products that are labeled for the garden and cockroaches um, because if we're going to be eating a vegetable or fruit from that garden and uh, we're using the wrong product, that becomes a hazard to us. I'll talk about that a little bit more with our fire and control. But again, we, this is just reading the product label and following the instructions and making sure that we're applying it in the right environment and for the right insect. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about red imported fire ants. It's originally from South America and it has been found in Al uh, it was introduced to Alabama in 1933. And since then, it is, it's been spread throughout the world. It is now a global pest insect. And it, similar to the Suriname cockroach, it got brought in through soils and turf and other plants that the uh, ant was residing in. Now, this ant uh, displays a strong colony defense behavior when they're disturbed. Many of the workers will come out and try to sting anything that they can. And these stings are very painful, and they can become pustules or big sores. And this is the current distribution of the bread and butter fire right here in the United States, but globally it is uh, well distributed mm -hmm. as well. So this is a, the recommended strategy for fire ant control is actually done in two steps. You use broadcast application of base to the lawn, and when you do that, you want to use one of these smaller seed spreaders, not one of the large fertilizer spreaders because you put too much bait out in the environment. These put out a little bit less bait, and so they're more effective and can be applied at the proper rate. Now the other thing you want to do is directly apply insecticide, liquid insecticide, to the mounds. Now if possible, you can use a high pressure sprayer as opposed to a normal sprayer because that will have greater penetration of the insecticide into the soil. Now the ants would be multiple inches or a foot into the ground, and so that's why that penetration of insecticide is critical.
But if you don't have a high pressure sprayer, all you do is drench them out instead. You just apply more volume of insecticide as opposed to using a high pressure sprayer. And this strategy is actually done once or twice a year based on the need. So you first apply the broadcast baits, you directly treat the mounds, and if more ants come, you can do it later on in the year. And there's a couple other strategies that we can use for fire ant control in general. We want to inspect our mulch, our sod, and soils before we purchase them from the store. If there are ants on them and ants present, we just don't want to uh, get them, so just avoid those if possible. There are also a lot of fast acting baits and dust insecticides that you can apply directly to the mound. You can see this individual here he's wearing gloves and a spoon, and they're just directly applying this uh, insecticide to the mound. Now sometimes, we, um, depending on the product, if it is a granular bait, it may ask you to apply water to that bait after you put it on the mound, um, and that just kind of causes a quicker activity of the, of the bait. But if you do not wet the bait, it'll actually uh, have longer lasting control, but it won't be as an immediate effect. Again, we don't want to apply insecticides when the soil is wet or it's rainy as a health risk. That's another reason why we don't want to do that. And we had somebody call earlier this year about using acetate in their garden, and this gets back to using products that are labeled for the garden and environment. Now, acetate is not supposed to be used for vegetables or fruits, but this individual used the acetate for fire ant control in their zucchini garden. Now, if you read the label on the product, it says not to do that. And this individual was actually unable to eat their zucchini for a whole year because they used a product that was not labeled for the garden. So we just want to be sure we're using the right products for the right pest in the right environment. And again, that goes back to reading the label. So now I want to talk a little bit about the tawny crazy ant, which is a new ant uh, to the southern United States, well, newish. It was actually introduced uh, in the early 2000s and 2002 to Houston, Texas, and it's actually fought over between Texas and Florida if it was introduced to Florida or Texas first. But since its initial introduction, it's spread to Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, and North Carolina. And so this is the uh, current distribution of the ant, and this is a potential spread of the 20 crazy ant in the United States. And what primarily limits its movement so far is cold temperatures. They can't tolerate things below 44.5 degrees, and so they're no longer active at that temperature, or below that temperature. So this ant is not considered a stinging pest like the fire ant. It is not a medical pest, which is good from that perspective. Uh, and they do not form mounds like the fire ant does. So they're, they make nests that are hidden in uh, the environment, in the soil, uh, in different human objects. And instead of having a stinger, they have an acid sprayer. Uh, and this is important because they actually fight, tummy crazy, or fight the fire ants. And I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in a moment. Now, the small colonies of tiny crazy ants are not so bad. And you'll see them out in the environment because they run around all crazy, and that's what gives them their name, the crazy ant. But what they do is they form these very large super colonies. And essentially what it is, is there will be different colonies of tawny crazy ants out in the environment, and they will recognize each other as friends and cooperate with each other. But they will combat other ants that are not tawny crazy ants. And when they form these super colonies, they have very high numbers of ants, which is disruptive to outdoor activities like gardening and recreation. And to give you an idea about the numbers of ants, this is a barn and this is a pile of dead ants that are all tiny crazy ants. So we'll be talking about hundreds of thousands, if not millions of individuals in some cases. Their activity decreases, or increases throughout the summertime and it starts to decline in the fall, again because of cold temperatures and lack of resources that are available. And if we don't control the tawny crazy ant, they will come back the next year. So, and when they do come back, there will be more of them. Do they live on the ground? Yes, so they do primarily nest in soil, mulch, uh, as well as potted plants, underneath potted plants, uh, leaf litter, uh, things like that. So if they don't form those conspicuous mounds, we have to search them out when we do want to control them. Uh, and look for the nesting sites. The workers will be numerous out in the environment. So th those are a little bit easier to find. But we wanna, uh, I'll talk about it here in a, a few minutes here. 
But what they do as a pest insect is they start to enter human structures uh, as well as our equipment and they start to nest in them. And when they form nests in the electronics, like air conditioning units, they short it out. Basically, they, a bunch of ants will go into the nest, the heat will build up, and it will cause the electronics to short out. And you can see a bunch of fried ants here in the air conditioning unit. They'll also go into uh, irrigation systems and hoses. They'll build a nest in it. And then when you turn that hose on, it'll burst potentially because of that debris that's in there. And also they'll enter the indoor environment uh, and become a pest in there as well. And what is interesting about the tiny crazy ant is that it's actually capable of displacing the red imported fire ant. They are from the same area of South America and they co-evolve together and they will fight. So what they do is the fire ant has a stinger, of course, with its venom, and the tiny crazy ant has its acid sprayer. And so when they come in contact with each other, the fire ant will put its venom on it. But what the, red, uh, the tiny crazy ant can do is it will spray its acid onto its legs and then apply its act, the, the tiny crazy ant acid all over its body and detoxify the red imported fire ant toxin. And there's been studies that show about 50% of the tawny crazy ants survive exposure to the red imported fire ant venom. And so that is why they're able to defeat the red imported fire ant in the environment. So what we want to do when we are buying things similar to the red imported fire ant, we want to try to prevent getting the tawny crazy ant in the first place. And we do that by inspecting mulch soil, sod, and plants from stores before we purchase them. And this is actually how we got the Tony Crazy Ant as well. Again, we can see that a common thread here with some of these pest insects is that they get moved around in soil, mulch, and by the plants. When we do have the, the Tony Crazy Ant, we want to exclude them from home, from the home environment by using different crops and sealants to prevent them from entering that environment. And you can see another large pile of the Tony Crazy Ants that are dead here, and similarly uh, here around this home. So when we're controlling the tawny crazy ant, they don't form those nice big mounds, so we have to thoroughly search the yard in order to find those nesting sites. Now, this is uh, different debris and clutter. This is something that would be very nice for the tawny crazy ant to hide in. Uh, they'll also go into the leaf litter, the mulch of these environments. And so what we want to do is have our sprayer with us. And as we find the ants in the environment, say we move a pot, and we locate a nesting area where there's brood and larva, we want to have our sprayer with us so we can immediately treat the ants. Because when we uncover them, they're going to go and hide. And so that way we can treat them right away without some of them getting away. When we see these big piles of ants, we want to clean them up uh, because the uh, live ants will walk over to the dead ants and avoid the insecticide treatment. So by removing those ants, we can get greater control. Now the liquid insecticides I had mentioned this earlier will get the fast knockdown of the tawny crazy ants, but we want to use uh, spray insecticides and baits, and I'll talk about the baits in, uh, in the next slide. But when we're searching the environment, again, we want to kind of find the, the queens. We want to find those good nesting areas where the individuals are reproducing and spray those, because that's where we're going to get the best control. And you also might need to remove the, the mulch and the leaf litter in order to find those nests in the environment to expose them in order to spray them more easily and get better control from that. Now, what's interesting, is another interesting fact I guess about the tiny crazy ant is that we don't necessarily know a lot about their food preferences. They consume insects, they consume the honeybee from aphids. But despite that, we haven't been able to come up with a very good bait for their control. And that's because their feeding preferences change very quickly. They may be interested in the bait for a short period of time, become uninterested in it, and then later on be interested in it again. And when we do apply baits, we want to use the same kind of granular formulations, but we want to use these uh, seed spreaders like we did for the fire net, but we don't have those mounds, so we can't directly treat anything uh, like we're doing um, for the fire net. So you want to do a broadcast bait application to the yard. And these are usually slower release formulations for the baits, which will provide longer control. And we don't want to bait the indoor environment. Does anybody want to guess why we don't want to bait indoors for our ants? We don't want ants inside them. Yeah, that's right, they'll come in. That's right, they'll come into the indoor environment and eat baits. I 
we don't want to do that. We want to use the spray insecticides in the indoor environment uh, or around the perimeter of the home in order to uh, control ants when possible. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about some yellow jackets. Now we've actually had quite a few calls about yellow jackets lately, so I figured I'd give uh, a little bit of information on these. And this is because we kind of have a little bit more of a conflict with the seeding pests during the fall time. Now we have two different uh, yellow jackets primarily. Well, there are a lot of different yellow jackets in the southern United States, but the two primary pest ones that we encounter are the eastern yellow jacket. And you can see here on this pronotum, that area behind his head it has a, more of a solid black pattern on it. And we also have the southern yellow jacket that has this striped pattern on its pronotum. So that's kind of how we can tell these two different yellow jackets apart from each other. So, yellow jackets are a close relative of ants, and in order to make their nests, what they do is they chew different plant and paper material out in the environment, as well as wood, and they spit it out and kind of make these paper nests. And what's unique about yellow jackets is they form two different kinds of nests. They'll form those aerial nests, up in things that we'll see in trees and on human objects, but they also nest in the ground. And these, ne these ground nests can also be very dangerous because you cannot see the nest and how many individuals are actually there. And again, the, the lower the tree holes, structural voids, so different uh, holes and sidings underneath shingles. They'll go into mouse burrows, and they also really like pine straw mulch. So this is something that they tend to prefer. Now, during the year, what they do is they primarily feed upon pest insects out in the environment. So in some ways, we can kind of think of them as beneficial. But towards the fall, there's a lot of them out in the environment, and that's when we seem to have more pest interactions. So as individuals, yellow jackets aren't as threatening unless you're allergic to them, in which case you probably are aware of that and you have them be kind of nearby. But the nests are dangerous, especially when they're large. Yellow jackets' nests contain hundreds if not thousands of individuals, and they can sting multiple times. And in fact, yellow jackets are the most lethal singing insect in the United States. They kill about 80 to 100 people a year. And we see more aggressive interactions with them in the fall time. And this isn't a behavioral difference. This is because their nests have grown so large and that there's so many mouths to feed that they have to go out further in order to find food. And also because it's the fall time, there's less insects for them to prey upon and so they're going to come to human outdoor activities where there's sugars, pops, you know, barbecue, things like that. And that's when we have more interactions with them. So when we're controlling the yellow uh, jackets, what we want to do is a few different things depending on the strat or where they are. Ideally, you treat them at night when all the workers are back in the colony and also they're sleeping so there's less threat. And also, if you treat when there's cold temperatures, they're going to be less active and they're going to be more sluggish. You want to wear thick clothes with long sleeves when you're treating for them as protective equipment. And when you use, uh, when you're experiencing aerial nests that are up in the trees or up in high on structures, you can get these different aerosol products that have long range. And essentially, they have a lot of fog output, so they'll spray a lot of insecticide very quickly. And that's what we want to do when we're controlling yellow jackets, is get a lot of product out there as quick as possible in order to control those yellow jackets and prevent us from being stung. Now, if we're mixing our own insecticide and spraying it, you want to add dish soap. You want to add several ounces of dish soap, and what that does is it actually uh, prevents the yellow jackets from flying as easily, and so they can't fly as well when they're exposed to that soap. And it'll also help knock that nest down afterwards. And if we're treating a ground nest, what we want to do is mix up three to five gallons of insecticide in a bucket. And similar to the, the spray insecticide, you want to add dish soap as an additive to that uh, insecticide in order to keep the yellow jackets from flying ants as well. You want to pour all of that insecticide in one application. So you quickly dump it into the hole and then you leave. You wait a day and you check back the next day and if they're still active in that ground nest, you want to apply again. 
Now I'm going to talk a little bit about this, so I'm just going to show you this uh, other recording. Well, it's actually a yellow jacket, but it's called the Bald Face Hornet. It's uh, primarily black with some white patterning on it. And they only form these big aerial nests. So now that it's fall time, you might see them up in the trees now that there's less leaves on, the, on those trees. Now these actually consume yellow jackets. Uh, they are very, they are aggressive if you uh, disturb them, but they're not as much of a threat as a yellow jacket is. And if they sting you, it's going to really hurt. So I would say this is more painful than the yellow jacket sting, but uh, these are not as pestiferous, but still something to be aware of uh, as a pest. Would you just say that, that, so the difference between a yellow jacket and a hornet and a wasp? Are there actually like Yes, so there are differences uh, in yellow jackets and wasps, and be, like, just like we alluded to. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how we can tell yellow jackets apart from other insects, uh, and if, I can give you some more information about how we can distinguish wasps from hornets and uh, bees. So there are actually a lot of yellow jacket mimics out in the environment, so I want to talk a little bit about that as well. And they do this as a means to protect themselves, so they imitate a stinging insect so that they're less likely to be bothered by another insect or people. And here's an example. This is probably something that you see frequently, is there's a lot of bee mimics that are flies. Uh, this is the yellow jacket fly here. We have a sugar maple longhorn beetle. So again, we can kind of see those yellow and black patterning to try to imitate a uh, yellow jacket. And we also have a wasp moth. It even has clear wings on it to further kind of give you that disguise. And they have this big abdomen here. And some of these yellow jacket mimics will actually do a tapping behavior. So when you grab them, they'll tap on you as if they're going to sting you, but they're really not doing anything. To again kind of give you that illusion that they are a threat. But what we can do to kind of tell apart some of these mimics from the natural yellow jacket is they have these mandibles, chewy mouth parts, whereas a fly has a spongy mouth part, and I can't really see that very well. But uh, these are kind of the typical chewing insect mouth parts that uh, yellow jacket will have, as well as wasps. They have four wings. Flies only have two wings. And they also have this pedicle, which is a narrow waist. Uh, so you can see uh, in this photo here, this moth does not have that pedicle, it has a, a widened waist. We don't see it here in this beetle, and we also see here in, the, in this fly that there is not a narrowing of the waist. But here we see this very thin area in the yellow jacket. Yes? Is that how um, a wasp, or I mean a yellow jacket, and a ant are similar? Yes, so that is one of the ways that you can, um, ants and yellow jackets are similar. They all share this pedicle. They have that narrow waist. Does that mean they can sting? Um, it is not what means that they can sting. What ants and yellow jackets have uh, is a modified ovipositor. And so in prehistoric yellow jackets, uh, well, their, their ancestors, those um, stingers are actually Ovipositors, which are egg layers, or for laying eggs. And so we'll talk a little bit about um, that in a moment. So, actually, because they are social insects and they cooperate, they've lost the need to have an ovipositor because the queen is the one producing all the eggs. And so they use that now for stinging as opposed to laying eggs. Now, here's the question for the audience. Does anybody know what this wasp is here? And I know there's another insect here, but we're hoping we want this answer to this one. Murder hornet. We get that a lot, but it's not <laughs> murder hornet. This is actually why I wanted to talk about it. This is the eastern cicada killer. So this is, in fact, the largest native wasp to the North America of the U.S. And a lot of people think that they're murder hornets, but they're not. And so that's why I wanted to talk about it today. And they're actually considered a beneficial insect because they control cicadas. They, the cicadas make that really loud, shrill, buzzing yeah. noise that we really don't like. So in that way, giant cicada killers are pretty good. 
the males are territorial, territorial, and so actually what they'll do is they'll fly right up to you and try to intimidate you. And so when you have a large insect that looks like it can sting you and it flies right up to you, that's kind of threatening. But in fact, these are actually quite harmless insects, believe it or not. The males do not have stingers, so the ones that fly up to you or are trying to exert their dominance don't even have a stinger to begin with. The females are much bigger, so they're about two inches, and the males are about an inch and a half, so there is some size differences in the individuals. What you'll probably see is these large nests that they make. They make these big holes, and they kick out a lot of sand. So you'll see these big sand mounds uh, that are pretty conspicuous out in the environment. And what the females do is they find a cicada, they sting it, and they bring it back to the nest. Now, when you see them uh, with a the cicada, they're probably going to be flying low to the ground because they're pretty heavy, and so it's a little bit more difficult for them to carry. But what the female does is they bring that cicada into their fertile, and because the cicada is paralyzed after being stung, they lay an egg on it, and that egg will hatch, it'll, form, it'll be a larva, and that larva will then eat the cicada. So every cicada is one larva for the nest. Uh, again, the males are territorial. They'll fly right up to you, but they don't have a stinger, so they'll try to intimidate you, but they're not going to be threatful, threatening. And the females are capable of stinging, but only in extreme circumstances. If you take a female uh, cicada killer and you grab it with your bare hand, you'll probably get stung. But otherwise, you're probably, that is the only example that I have found of people being stung by this uh, wasp is by grabbing it or stepping on it. So even though it is big and intimidating, it's not considered a, uh, a seed pest that we need to be too concerned about. But despite being considered a beneficial insect, they can go to very large numbers and some people can be afraid of them. For example, the UPS man might not want to come to your house because you have too many of these flying around your yard like my parents had. So the UPS guy wouldn't deliver packages anymore. So sometimes you have to be pest control. And in this case, what you don't want to do is use a liquid insecticide. You just want to use a dust insecticide, and you just apply it to the entryway of the uh, hole. But you don't want to use a liquid insecticide because it'll just get absorbed by the soil, and it won't be effective. But it dust will be. You can also capture them using a net, and then just put them in a freezer because they're not too dangerous. So, depending on how uh, many wasps you need to get rid of, you can decide which way to control them. Are they acquiring the uh, cicada populations? So, they actually control cicadas in a, they're considered a beneficial insect because they control cicadas. So, why are cicadas not, what is it makes them or bad about a cicada? Well, they're just, so a cicadas actually uh, are, feeding upon the roots of primarily pine trees. So they're like an aphid in that they're out there on the roots feeding, like sucking the blood of the trees. And so that's why they're considered infest. They don't necessarily do a ton of damage because they're uh, such a slow feeder, but they are considered uh, a pest because of their noise as well as their ability to be on the uh, pine tree roots. What's the cicada in uh, they're well distributed throughout uh, North America. I imagine they're probably all over. But are they native to North America? Yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, the giant cicada killer is as well. This is the, the largest native wasp to uh, North America. And we get a lot of calls. People think that they're murder hornets often, so that's why I wanted to talk about them today. Cool. Yes. The crazy ants. I thought I heard you say that they really don't bite or sting. Yes, that is true. It's so, just the number of them that you get that make them bad? Yes, so it, it is exactly that. It's the number of them will be out in your yard, they'll be all over your carport. You know, you'll go out and do some gardening and they'll be crawling all over you. Uh, and they're very disruptive because of that. And then there's that potential for them to enter in your electronics and short them out, and then uh, potentially nesting in the hose as well, or the irrigation systems. So Tony Crazy Ants, um, we do get a lot of calls for them, but it seems like their distribution is a little bit more sporadic right now. Um, but when they are a big pest problem, they are very hard to get rid of. Okay, I think, did somebody open a question? 
I've been hearing lately to leave your leaves and mulch and stuff like that over the winter and stuff because um, butterflies, larvas, whatever bugs, beneficial bugs, mm -hmm. live in them over the winter. That's true, yes. So, what? How to balance? How to balance stuff if you're leaving them? Yes, so that goes to uh, thinning out the mulch. So if possible, you want to have that two to three inch layer of mulch, but if you let it build up too much, then that's when you're probably going to have more of those pest issues. Okay. Uh, like with cockroaches and ants in there. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm going back to the cockroaches, um, I know it's common knowledge that cockroaches are dirty and they spread pathogens, but I'm wondering how, if there have been studies that actually prove or um, illuminate how common it is that pathogen transmission happens in our modern day So I, I don't think there is with cockroaches. Okay. There's been some studies that show that like they can acquire bacteria that are pathogenic, but I don't think there's ever been like okay, we found the cockroach here, mm -hmm. and then in the house we also found this bacteria that is a human pathogen yeah. that the person eventually got. Um, yeah, it's just something I've been interested in because I feel like it's, it's such, like, common knowledge, but I don't know if it's really just like fear of the insect, or it actually is dangerous, or it's just that they are, you know, one of the main insects that we find in our home, and that's kind of scary. Yeah. Like how much of it is just kind of people having fear of insects. So that, that is a really good question. It is something I'm interested in um, from a research perspective. So one of the things is that, for example, rats in New Orleans, the sewer environment, they found, uh, there was a study, and they found between uh, 10 and 12% have certain human pathogens. And I assume because American cockroaches occupy that same environment, that they could also be potentially acquiring those um, pathogens because they kind of act as reservoirs in some cases. Um, cockroaches essentially, they have bacteria that they need to uh, grow and develop. They actually have bacteria that's named after them. So they are kind of um, good organisms for harboring bacteria because they seem to just be generally less impacted by them. Um, so I guess the, I'm giving a roundabout answer by saying, I don't know, but it is something that I'm interested in trying to figure out um, what that pathogen transmission is like with cockroaches. Mm -hmm. Did they really survive the dinosaurs, the ice age? Yeah, so cockroaches are at least 300 million years old, and their bodies have remained unchanged for 150 million years. So, yeah, they've been around for a long time. And they're Stop so scary. <laughs> yeah, it's a step on the Yeah, right. And, uh, yesterday I had a cockroach in my house. And I gave it, you know, give it the old shoe. <laughs> That's the best way to deal with them, I think. I don't know. Yeah, unless there's too many of them. Then, then, we gotta, then this, you can't use the shoe as quick as you like, right? No. Did you talk about the ones that we always call the tree hugs? Uh, so I did not. That is the, there's two different cockroaches that I've, uh, I was in with this. So the other three is the, the American cockroach, and then there's the smoky brown cockroach, um, which is like a, it looks like the American cockroach, but it's slightly smaller. It's uh, a black, dark brown color, um, and they also uh, live in the leaf litter and environments like that. But the cockroach control methods that I mentioned for the Suriname cockroach and the Asian cockroach will also work for tree roaches. So you can use those same strategies for those. Yeah. Um, the yeah, part. Yeah, part. Those are the ones that we have. Yep, yeah, because we do, we do experience those ones a lot as well. We had a lot, I think it was like 29 different um, cockroach species in Louisiana. Figures. So, we got a lot. <laughs> Are those the ones, the trees that are the ones that fly? They all seem to fly. Yeah, a lot of them will, but it, it's temperature dependent. So some of them can only fly when it's warm enough uh, to do it, but you're right, a lot of them do fly. Unfortunately. Yeah, once again, it's them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you. Thank you.